Chapter 11. So, I said, taking a bite off an apple and then offering it to Lester, what's the story with Tammy? Lester shook his head and a no thank you to the apple. Me and him were sitting on the couch in the back. Ivan was purring in my lap. Rodeo was up at the wheel muttering to himself. The Lester introduction had woken him up enough to get in a few more miles before handing the keys over. Uh, long story, Lester said in answer to my question. He was sitting pretty stiffly on the couch, his back straight, his eyes bouncing around our home, his arms around the duffel he held in his lap. He looked decidedly ill at ease, and I could see second thoughts passing like clouds over his face. Some of them looked to be darn near third or even fourth thoughts, so I figured I'd better put him at ease with some stimulating conversation and fresh fruit. Oh, and with a cat. Cats relax, folks. That's just the truth. So I scooped Ivan up out of my lap and handed him over to Lester. Here, could you hold him? My legs are going to sleep. Lester gave Ivan a less than a super excited look, but slid the duffel off his lap and took him. He set him down on his legs, and Ivan did some sniffing and turning, but seeing as how he's the best cat in the world, he settled right on in, and Lester gave him some pets, and I could see right away that he started to relax a little. We got time, Lester. What are we talking here? Girlfriend, sister, wife? Lester looked me up and down, deciding on whether or not to answer me. Come on, I said. We got to get to know each other. I introduced you to Rodeo. Now you introduce me to Tammy. I held the apple toward him again. Lester shrugged, took the apple and bit off a chunk, and handed it back to me, and then said through his chewing, Girlfriend, I guess, maybe. Girlfriend, you guess, maybe? Huh. You guys sound close. Lester gave me a glare. It's complicated, he said. I took a crunchy bite and shook my head as I passed the apple. Nah, love is never as complicated as it seems. Lester's eyes twinkled. And you know all about love? I picked at a bit of apple skin between my teeth. I know plenty. Really? Yes, as a matter of fact. You see those books over there on the bottom shelf? I pointed with the apple at the bookshelf. Those are all mine. I got even more in my room. I've read every single one of them. Some of them twice. And see the top shelf? Those are Rodeo's books. Grown-up books. I've read most of those, too. And every book ever written is about love, really, whether it knows it or not. So, yeah, I know a thing or two about love. Lester blinked at me and pinched his lips together in one of those smug, know-it-all smirks that grown-ups have that can just about drive you crazy. But I forged onward. So, based on your answer to my first question, I'm guessing Tammy is either a used-to-be-your-girlfriend or a you-hope-she'll-be-your-girlfriend someday. Which one is she? Lester took two more bites of the apple before passing it back and answering, Both, kind of, he said. Ah, I get it. She broke your heart, left you alone, took off for Boise. I've seen it a hundred times. Really? Yep. So did she leave you for another fella? I reached out for the apple, but Lester got all stone-faced and finished it to the core in about three more monster bites. Lester sighed. One of those, why has this happened to me and how can I get out of it kind of sighs. He dropped his head and fixed me with a stare. You're not going to drop this till I give you the details, are you? Absolutely not, he sighed again. But the second time was more of an, okay, fine, let's get this over with kind. Then he filled me in. Lester Washington played the upright bass in some sort of bluesy, rootsy band called the Strut Kings, which sounded cool as heck in my book. He straight out lit up when he talked about music in the Strut Kings. It was like how Rodeo gets when he talks about taco trucks, but even more, which is saying something. You could just tell that Lester and music were like me and Ivan, and me and Ivan were like macaroni and cheese, so it really, so it was really a meant-to-be-together kind of situation all around. Now, Tammy and Boise apparently had other thoughts. Lester was a little stingy with the details, but I got the impression she wasn't super interested in the broke-as-a-joke musician living his dream and trying to make it work scene. He had some communications degree from college that she thought he should be doing more with, but when he left the full-time job he hated to spend more time on his music, she left him. And then she left the entire state of Florida. I'm not going to lie. I wasn't all that impressed with Tammy, but I told myself, I hadn't heard her side of the story. She says if I wear a tie, she'll wear a ring. I looked at him blankly. 
If I get a real job, she'll marry me, he explained. What about the Strut Kings? I asked. Lester shrugged. Boys who's got bands, I bet. I could probably play on the weekends or something. Now, I don't know about most folks, but I can't imagine only having cheese on my macaroni on the weekends. But love's a crazy thing, I know that. And if Tammy was the one for Lester, then I suppose there's worse things than moving to Boise to get her back. It kind of made me think, actually. What Lester was doing for Tammy was really something. He loved her, so he was biting the bullet and doing something tough because it mattered to her. It was nice, him doing that for her. Okay, I said once he'd given me the lowdown. Well, I wish you luck in winning her back, Lester. Lester worked some apple bits out of his teeth with his tongue. Thanks. Glad I got your support. Sure thing. So tell me. Boise is an awful long way to go for somebody that already broke your heart. What's so great about her? Why should I tell you that? Because it's good practice, man. You're trying to woo her back, right? You better get this stuff down. Lay it on me. What do you love about Tammy? Lester sucked on his teeth for a second, then rolled his eyes and leaned back on the couch and looked me in the eye. She got this great laugh, he began. Sounds like music. She's just about always in a good mood, and when she's not, she snaps herself out of it pretty quick. His eyes drifted away from mine, and a little smile started to play on his lips. And when someone's feeling down, she'll do just about anything to cheer him up. His eyes came back to me. That, he said, that is what I love about her. I shook my head. Nope, Lester. If you want me to believe it's worth taking you all the way across nine states, you gotta do better than that. He pulled his head back. Excuse me? What's wrong with that? All you gave me is reasons why anybody might love her. Heck, why I might love her if I met her. You didn't say anything about why you love her. Lester screwed up his eyes doubtfully at me. Okay, look, I explained, pointing up at the front of the bus. Look at Rodeo up there. There's plenty of reasons anyone might love him if they could get past the greasy doormat he calls hair. He's kind to everyone. He helps strangers. He's a gold medal listener. That's all great stuff, right? But that's different than why I love him. Lester snorted. Then why do you love him? I thought for a moment. I love Rodeo because if tomorrow I spit in his face and threw all his favorite books out the window and called him all the worst words I could think of, he wouldn't love me one bit less. The bus rocked and swayed underneath us. I kept my eyes on Rodeo on the back of his shaggy head bobbing to the music. I love Rodeo because on the worst day of my life he held me and held me and held me and held me and didn't let go. I tried to clear my throat but kind of failed so I went on in a scratchy sort of whisper. I love Rodeo because if I didn't love him he'd fall apart. I looked out the window, blinked a few times, filled my lungs with air and then emptied them. I could feel Lester watching me. I counted ten cars whizzed past us in the other direction, then looked back at him. That's what you gotta do, Lester. Don't tell me why she's perfect. Tell me why she's perfect for you. Lester was eyeing me in a thoughtful, intense kind of way. To tell you the truth, it reminded me of Ivan, which was only more points in Lester's favor. That's a lot of wisdom for a kid to drop, he said at last. I'm almost 13, and it ain't my wisdom either. No, Lester smirked. Whose wisdom is it? It's, it's, it was, I dropped my voice to a whisper and kept an eye on Rodeo. It was my mom's. Talking about her at all was a strict no-go, and doing it on board Jaeger was like farting in church. But something about Lester's listening eyes and something about the secret mission I was on at that very moment made it easier to walk away from that role, at least for a minute. She had me and my sisters write letters to each other one day. We had to say what we loved most about each other, and it couldn't just be something nice about them. It had to be unique and special to us, what we loved about each other. She had to write the words for my little sister, but we all did it. Me and my sister sat down and we wrote what we loved about each other. Lester looked around the rattling bus. Where are they at, your mom and sisters? I picked at a thread that was trailing out of a seam in my jeans. Oh, I answered, trying to pluck the thread out without unraveling any more. They're dead, Lester. My eyes flashed up quick to Lester. I liked that he wasn't making some syrupy, sympathetic face, 
like that he didn't look away, like that he didn't cluck his tongue or bite his lip or anything stupid like that. But I'm glad we wrote those letters. We passed a semi-truck, and for a few seconds we were lost in the rumbling thunder of the tractor-trailer. Up at the front, Rodeo stretched dramatically and let out a flamboyant yawn. Woo-hee, he hooted. Put a fork in me, y'all, I'm done. He slapped his face a few times and then flicked on the turn signal and steered Jaeger off onto an exit ramp. The bus shuddered around us as it slowed down from highway speed. Looks like it's your turn to drive, I said, poking Lester's knee and standing up, holding myself steady with the arm of the couch. Lester was still looking at me. What did your sisters say, he asked. Why'd they say they loved you? I don't know. We never read the letters. Lester blinked. What'd you do with them? I stepped past him, heading toward the front of the bus in a badly needed bathroom break. We put them in a box and buried them in a park, I answered. In retrospect, what happened next was at least partly my fault, but I'll never admit that to Rodeo because I don't want to let him off that easy. It all started with Rodeo and Lester arguing over a map. We were at a random gas station somewhere outside Gainesville, Florida. The sun had set and it was starting to smell like nighttime. There was still a little purple glow on the western horizon, but it was dim and fading fast. Darkness was on the way. Lester had just been given the briefing on how to handle Jaeger, though Rodeo was more than a little reluctant to hand over the keys, and was getting ready for his first shift behind the wheel. I came wandering back from the gas station bathroom, snapping my gum and humming a little song to find those two bickering out in the parking lot, waiting for the pump to finish filling our tank. I'm telling you, man, you've got to start using a phone, Lester was saying in an argument I could have told him was a lost cause. Using a paper map is crazy. Rodeo was smiling serenely, the open atlas in his hands. Yeah, brother, what can your phone do that my map can't? Are you kidding? Lester sputtered. Everything. Check this out. Lester stepped shoulder to shoulder with Rodeo so Rodeo could see the screen. I can just type in where I want to go, and it'll tell me the whole route, turns and everything. Shows me how long it'll take. It even tells me if there's construction or delays or anything. My interest was piqued. Let me see that, I said, and elbowed my way into their huddle. The candy bright screen before my eyes was a revelation. I'd always seen folks playing on their phones, but I'd only ever used phones I'd borrowed to make phone calls. On Lester's phone was a map, all colorful and clear. There was a blue line from where we were to a glowing red pushpin labeled Boise. It said right there on the bottom of the screen, 36 hours, 2,504 miles. No dental floss or long division required. It was a miracle. I did the math real quick. We still had 60 hours until Wednesday morning came along. Plenty of time, I figured. Not a lot of wiggle room for wandering or lollygagging, but we were on schedule. I beamed up at Lester and Rodeo. This is fantastic, I said. Lester nodded. nodded. Rodeo scowled. Aw, oh, take the knife out of my back, sweetie pie. You gonna abandon me for this heartless piece of technological soul poison? I could tell Rodeo was in a dramatic mood, and my mind was too bubbly with maps and timelines to engage. I'm going to bed. I lied, knowing full well I was going to lay in my room and strategize a way to get us from Boise to home instead of Boise to Butte. I leveled a finger at Rodeo as I walked away, and now I want a phone for Christmas. Rodeo howled in theatrical horror, and I left them to their conversation. I was walking up Jaeger's steps when my stomach gave a little rumble. I shrugged and grabbed a few bills from our cash jar and changed direction. Back down the stairs and off the bus and toward the gas station. Behind me, I heard Rodeo making some loud point about how he didn't have to plug in his map, but I shook my head and kept walking. And it's that darn stomach rumble that got me in a heap of trouble, see? Because I didn't look back over my shoulder, so I didn't see Rodeo taking the gas nozzle out of Jaeger and putting it back on its cradle. And I didn't see Rodeo and Lester climbing back into Jaeger, still talking maps and phones. And I didn't see the door closing behind him. What I did see, though, when I came back out a few minutes later with a mouthful of corn nuts, was an empty parking lot and not a bus or a hippie in sight.